You all that didn't know, Carol and I were in Germany last week visiting with my, my parents. And uh, we had a nice time. We were only there for eight days. We got back Tuesday night. We're still, we're still on German time. It's amazing how long it takes to adjust back. But uh, we watched Rebecca's sermon. If you were here last week, awesome sermon. She's actually one of my like two or three favorite preachers. And uh, great sermon. I, all week I'm like, I am never saying I got this again. Because I don't got it. So uh, if you haven't watched, if you didn't, weren't here last week, go on YouTube and, and watch her sermon. It, it's really worth the watch. It will really make you think about your, your walk with God. All right, Phil, Philemon, chat, verse 4, or Philemon. It's only one chapter if you're asking me what chapter. So we're going to chapter 1, the only chapter, verse 4. We talked about this two weeks ago. And I wanted to talk about it again this week. I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. We talked about this two weeks ago. He said that the sharing of your faith might become effective. Now let's define these terms. That word sharing is the Greek word koinonia, it means partnership. It says your faith is good, it's supposed to be in partnership. Who is your faith supposed to be in partnership with? Any ideas? With Jesus. With, with, the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Not me, but Christ in me. In the life that I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God. He said, if you want the partnership of your faith to be effective, now that word effective is an interesting word, it's the Greek word energeus. It, we get our English word energize. It's literally the word we translate energize. He said the partnership of your faith will be energized by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you. He said if you want to energize that faith that you're partnering with God, let me tell you something. This should relieve you of the terrible burdens of faith. You don't have enough faith. Y'all are looking at me, well, I thought this was a faith-believing church. It is a faith-believing church, but it's the faith of Jesus that will get you over. Your own faith, how many of y'all can identify your own faith has not been enough in times past? We do all the right faith steps and do all the right faith things and do all the right things we're supposed to do to operate in faith and our confession straight and we're getting in the Word, we're doing, and it's not working. Well, what I'm going to talk about tonight is why isn't it working? He said, if you want your faith to be effective, if you want it to be energized, you want it to be partnered with Jesus, you have to acknowledge every good thing which is in you. That word acknowledge, it's the Greek word, it means to recognize the thing that already is and to acknowledge it. It says you have to recognize it and acknowledge it. I love Webster's Dictionary, 1828. To admit it to be true and to declare that it's true, that's acknowledge. He says, you've got to, if you want your faith to be effective, energized, he said, you're going to have to start declaring all the good things that are in you. See, most of the time, most of us spend all the time declaring all the bad stuff in us. I'm guilty as anybody. We declare, oh, man, I just, I just got this anger issue. Oh, I just got this, this problem here. I got this. I'm, I'm just so no good. I'm this. I'm that. People, we're very good, and we think that's being humble. That isn't being humble, it's being stupid. Because he said here, he said, if you want your faith to be energized, acknowledge every good thing that is in you. Turn over to Colossians 1.26. What good things are in you? That's the question. A lot of y'all go, well, I don't know that there's anything good in me. Well, we're going to answer that. We're going to deal with that. We dealt with it two weeks ago, but we're going to deal with it some more. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations but now has been revealed to his saints. So it's a mystery that's been revealed to us. It's a mystery that God has led us in on. Let's find out what the mystery is. To them God willed, to them who? The saints. And how many of y'all are a saint? Raise your hand. Well, I don't feel like a saint. Well, if you're born again, you're a saint. You don't need the Catholic Church to do something. You don't need the Catholic Church to throw water on you and be, do whatever they do to turn you into a saint. If you're a believer, the Bible calls you a saint. And he said, to them, the saints, God will to make known that what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, what's the mystery? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
He said, there's a mystery that people in the world don't understand, and I will suggest to you most people in the church don't understand, is that Jesus Christ lives inside of us. You know in Hebrews it says the old, the old uh, patriarchs, Abraham and David and Moses, said they desperately wanted, Hebrews chapter 11, what we have. What is it they wanted that they couldn't have? They couldn't have Christ in them. They could have the Holy Spirit on them, but it was temporary. We have Jesus living in us. Paul said, this is the mystery. Christ in you, but it's not just Christ in you, it's the hope of glory. Uh, the word hope is elpis, it's the Greek word elpis, to anticipate with pleasure. He said, the mystery is Christ in you that allows you to anticipate with pleasure, doxa, God's good opinion, estimate, and honor resulting from his good opinion. He said, you should get pleasure. Christ is in you, and you should get pleasure from this idea that he has a good opinion of you. Why does he have a good opinion of you? I met some of y'all. I can't figure out why he has a good opinion of you. I know why he has a good opinion of you. Because Christ, he said, that's the mystery. How can God have a good opinion of me? The answer's right there. Because Jesus is in me. That's the mystery. He said, Christ in you is that joyful expectation, that hope, that delight, that pleasure of knowing God has a good opinion of you. That's what the word glory means, doxa. It means to have a good opinion. So God, Christ in you is what's good in you. When he says, if you want to energize your faith, you're going to have to acknowledge the good in you. Christ, did. remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, good master, what must I do? And what did Jesus say? Nobody's good but one, God. Don't think that that verse is saying all the good things. Well, I'm good at music, I'm good at singing, I'm good at numbers, I'm good at reading. That's not what he's talking about acknowledging. In fact, you need to listen to last week's sermon. You're no good at those things, no matter how good you are at them. I don't care how good you think you are, you're not good enough. That's not the good thing we're acknowledging. What we're acknowledging is Christ in us. Whatever's in Jesus, okay, this is, this is deep, ready? Y'all pay attention here. If it's in Jesus and he's in you, then what's in Jesus is in you. Does everybody get that? When Jesus came into you, what's in Jesus is in you. You didn't get like some watered down half Jesus. You didn't get, well, sort of Jesus comes and lives with you. So pretend Jesus. We saw a movie years ago. I can't remember what the movie was. But the, there was a, there was a, people had a plastic Jesus up on their dashboard. And, you know, when the car would drive, the little plastic Jesus would wave around. They even had a little song, plastic Jesus, plastic Jesus, dancing on the dashboard of my car. That's kind of what we think of. It's not plastic Jesus that's living inside of us. It's not pretend Jesus. It is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the universe. We sang that song, all hail King Jesus. All hail the savior of the world. He came inside of you and he told us, you're going to have to start acknowledging. You're going to have to start saying that good thing that's down inside of you. Acknowledge the good that's in you. Quit saying, I have an anger management problem. You don't. You have an ignorance problem because the problem is you aren't acknowledging the good thing that's in you, which is Christ Jesus, and that good thing is the fruit of the Spirit. That good thing is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. You have the life of God. How many of y'all picture Jesus with an anger management problem? He's going, Father, take this cup of anger management issues away from me. I'm struggling. I just can't control my temper. Y'all can't picture Jesus that way. Well, you shouldn't be able to picture yourself that way. He, should, he said, you get energized by acknowledging what's good in you, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, verse 3. Colossians 3, 3. For you died. Yay! You died. That crummy old you, that bad old you, you're dead. You, don't, you should never have a problem with the old you because the old you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. 
He said, when Jesus appears, you will appear with him. We read these verses like it's way out in the future when Jesus comes back. Well, you know what? When you let Jesus that's in you out, he just appeared. When you, when you get ready to say something unkind, and you acknowledge the good Jesus that's in you, and you say something kind instead, it says, you will be with him, you will appear with him in glory. You will be manifesting Jesus. That's what he's telling us to do. You, you can't do it, but you don't have to do it. All you have to do is, is acknowledge it. Acknowledge, I've got Jesus in here. Turn over to Colossians, let's go backwards. Colossians 1.12. Colossians 1.12. This is the, as I've been studying, it's like, why have I struggled for all these years in my Christianity? Why have you struggled? You're going to go, why? This is, this is so easy, a child can do it. I think Jesus said that, if I'm not mistaken. This is so easy, any little kid can do it. The problem is we get grown up and we don't believe this. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. Pay attention to that because we're going to come back to disqualified a little later giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He said, you are qualified for the inheritance of a saint. So say it, I am qualified. Keep going. Verse 13. He has delivered us, past tense, from the power of darkness and translated as the King James Version, conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He, Jesus, is the image of God. Well, if Jesus is the image of God, and Jesus lives in you, guess what you are? The image of God. Well, I don't feel like the image of God because you aren't acknowledging it. You aren't energizing it. That's the whole point of tonight's message. We have it in here, and most of the time we don't acknowledge it. We feel so weak. We feel so defeated. We feel so helpless. We feel so weak, and we, that's what we acknowledge. And he said, no, you acknowledge the good thing that's in you, and that will energize your faith. Keep going. For by him all things were created. They were in heaven and on the earth and visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Next verse. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Now, let's stop and think about what this just said. Go back to the verse 16. It's talking about Jesus. Him, all things were created. If all things were created by Jesus and Jesus lives inside of you, let's run a list of things that are too big for him to fix. What, it, what would be too big for Jesus to fix? Can y'all name something? And you go, well, that's silly. He created all things. So bingo. Bingo. He created all things and he's inside of you. It says acknowledge that. Whether visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, United States government, Chinese government, the World Economic Forum, whatever it is that's freaking us out should not bother us one teeny weeny little bit because Jesus who created and has the power of, over all that is inside of me. He's down in here. And he said he is before all things in verse 17. He is before all things and in him all things consist. In fact, the next time you want to impress somebody with your quantum physics knowledge, because I don't know if you know this about quantum physics. They actually have no clue why everything doesn't fly apart. Literally at the quantum level, which is the subatomic level, everything seems chaotic and it seems like everything, that chair should just fly apart. But it doesn't fly apart. Why doesn't it? And they have no idea. The, the most brilliant physicists have no idea why things don't fly apart. But now you know. In him all things consist. I think the King James says hold together. Jesus holds it all together. Jesus is the source of all creation. Jesus can, re we, Jesus can regrow limbs. Jesus can regrow teeth. Jesus can fix anything, anywhere, anytime. We know that. We know he can, but what we don't know is he's in here. He's down inside. All the power that created the universe is inside of you. Forget these doofy superhero movies 
where the guy can shoot lasers out of his arm, hands or forget all that. That's all foolishness and it's all pretend. This is not foolishness and this is not pretend. The king of the universe, all oh, hail King Jesus. He lives in sight of us and all the power. I heard Lance Wallnau say this years ago and I love this saying. He said, if we don't learn to go within, we will go without. It's all in here. The power of God, the creative power of God is in here. Philippians 2.9. Philippians 2.9. I'm trying to explain to you who's in here. It's easy. We tell little children, well, Jesus lives in your heart, but we really mean little plastic Jesus. Little Jesus, it's a little cute thing we tell children. No, Jesus lives in your heart. Jesus, the king of the universe, lives in your heart. Look at what he says in Philippians 2.9. Therefore God has highly exalted him, Jesus, given him a name which is above every name. Keep going. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. He said every knee has to bow, every tongue has to confess. I mean, how many of us are afraid of whatever? Name something. Just name something. It doesn't matter what. We'll, we'll name something really scary. Uh, cancer. Is cancer a name? Is Jesus' name exalted higher than that name? Does that have to bow at the name of Jesus? We know it in church. We know it here. If you've been coming here, you know it. You know it here. The problem is you've got to know it out there. When you get out there and you're standing in the doctor's office and the doctor says you got whatever, you need to know greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. The power of all creation is inside of me. This thing must bow its knee to the name of Jesus. This thing must obey the word of God. We need to become so aware. He said you've got to acknowledge the good thing that's in you to energize your faith. One of the reasons our faith isn't energized and partnered with Jesus is we don't acknowledge what's in here. We, we think that we got to get God to do things. In fact, there is this, this concept, and it's pretty universal, that you got to motivate God to do things. What do I mean? Most people, we wouldn't say it this way, but we pray it this way. We think, let's just use healing. How do you get healing? We well, got to talk God into it, right? You got you to pray and, 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 you know, get a book, preferably with like 11 different steps to healing, because if step does, one doesn't work, you can try step two, and then you can try step three, and then you can try step four, and maybe one and three and five will work together, and then you can get another book that tells you why that book doesn't work, but this book will work, and then you can, you can maybe, we'll, we'll pray an hour a day, and maybe we'll do this an hour a day, and maybe if you confess this long enough, and maybe if you say it, 300 times instead of 200 times and and we get all caught up because we think we're trying to motivate God to do something. I have some wonderful news for you or some terrible news for you, whichever it is you prefer, how do you prefer to accept it. You, God's not going to do a thing. He's not going to do anything. He's not going to do anything for you. He's just not. He sat down and so did Jesus. The Bible said Jesus sat down. What does sat down mean? Done. He's done. Uh, at the end of the day, if you had a hard day working, if, you're, if you work physically, I remember when I, when I first went to college, Carol and I got married and I got a job at UPS loading trucks. And my first day, I mean, you have to, you had to, there was a guy with a stopwatch. You had to move a certain number of boxes every minute. And they're yelling at you and they're, they're, you're pushing boxes out. I got home, I couldn't even move my first day. I sat down. I, didn't, I did not get out of my chair again that day. That's not exactly what he's talking about, but that's the image. Jesus sat down. The Bible said he wants to crush Satan under your feet. How does he do that? By you acknowledging all the good things that are in you. This is the good news. You don't need to motivate God to do anything. It's already done. Well, where is it, Pastor Tom? It's in here. How do I get it out? Start acknowledging it. Start acknowledging the good things that are in here. Start acknowledging Christ Jesus is in here, the creator of the universe. Surely he can fix my blonde hair to make it less blonde. Surely, I mean, y'all might think I'm weird, but I've started talking to my hair. You know, and, and y'all go, well, it's not going to work. Well, you don't know. You don't know. I mean, I'm fighting scripture because scripture says gray hair is a, is a glory to a man. And so I'm kind of fighting scripture. But I'm looking for some scriptures on, on darker hair. 
If you want to just color it. <laughs> but the reality is, it's all in here. It's inside of you. He said, acknowledge. You said you energize and partner your faith with Jesus when you acknowledge. You're not acknowledging. It's, it's exactly the opposite of Rebecca's sermon last week. You ain't got it. You don't have enough faith to get yourself healed. You don't have enough of faithfulness to get yourself delivered. You don't have enough anointing to get yourself free. You don't have enough of anything in you, in your own ability. In your own ability, you can't do squat. Quoting Jesus, apart from me, you can do nothing if you prefer the biblical version. You can't do a thing without him. You don't got it. You can't do it. But it doesn't matter because he that is in you the life that I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God. I live by Jesus' faith. I live by Jesus' victory. I live by Jesus in me. It's all inside of here. You don't need to motivate God. First John 4.4, 4, I've been quoting it. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And he's literally talking about the Antichrist. Literally, if you read 1 John 4, 3, he's talking about the spirit of the Antichrist. You and I have something greater. Because we're reading all this end time stuff. Maybe the Samas stuff, maybe World War III, maybe end times. My response is, who cares? I say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come and get us. Come quickly. Why would we? He said, greater is he that's in you than the Antichrist. Greater is he that's in you than terrorists and sickness and disease. I mean, they're, you know, they're already co concocting another pandemic of some sort. What do we care? He is in us, but we've got to acknowledge it. We've got to acknowledge that he's inside of us. Colossians 2.8. If you haven't figured out, you ought to read the book of Colossians. We've been quoting a bunch from the book of Colossians because it talks about the deity of the Lord Jesus that's in you. Colossians 2.8. Beware, beware, beware. The huffle lumps and woozles will get your, your honey if you're not aware. So you beware, <laughs> lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Don't let them cheat you. Where does philosophy and empty deceit come from? I will submit to you it comes from most pulpits in America. What kind of philosophy and empty deceit? You got to do this. You got to pray more. You, got to, you haven't prayed down the glory. You haven't prayed down God. You, you've got to fast longer. It's philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. He said, don't let them fool you. You don't do it the way the world does it. You don't solve problems the way the world solves problems. You don't get delivered the way the world gets delivered. And you don't get delivered the way the most of the church world, well, most of the church world never gets delivered. And this is the reason why. Keep going. For in him, Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus dwells all fullness of God in your body. For in him dwells all the fullness of God bodily. Keep going. And you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Go back. You are complete in him. Remember what I said? You're trying to motivate God. You're trying to get God to do something. He said, you don't need to motivate God. What does complete mean? Anybody? I mean, that's a deep word that we may, may not quite understand what complete means. What's some, what's some synonyms for complete? Finished. Done. Nothing left to do. He said, you are finished, complete. In fact, doesn't the Bible say Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith? He makes your faith grow. He makes your faith work. Not you. You can't. You are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. No power, nothing is bigger or stronger than Jesus. Nothing is too difficult for him. Jesus said all things are possible. Is anything, you read the Old Testament. One of the things that irritated God in the Old Testament, and he said it over and over again, it says, is anything too difficult for the Lord? Because they were constantly testing God. Well, can God give us food in the desert? Can God give us water? If the, if the supply chains break down, can God feed us? Yes. If, if a pandemic hits again, can God keep us healthy? Yes. If all the money runs out and they go to a digital currency and, and you can't buy or sell without a mark, can you be okay? Yes. If you acknowledge the greater one that's in here, if you make him the center of your life, you say, Lord Jesus, 
I, I used to think I was a really good lawyer. I used to think that. And what I've discovered over the last year, I'm still a really good lawyer in my natural ability, but I've discovered I'm a way better lawyer in Jesus' ability. I've discovered I'm a way better everything in Jesus' ability. Because I, I was a chief sinner. That's why I liked Rebecca's sermon so much. I've been a chief sinner of, like, I got this. I, I know how to do this. I know how to handle this. And I have, my prayer of, of the last few months has been, God, I don't think, it's been Solomon's prayer. I don't know how to come in and go out. I don't know how to do anything anymore, Lord. You've got to help me. You've got to help me with every part of my life because greater are you in me. God knows stuff. He knows what to do. He knows how to get your car running right. He knows how to get you a new car. He knows how to get your body healthy. He knows how to get your family healthy. He knows stuff. And he said, we are complete in him. Turn over to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, 20. Lest you think this is an isolated verse. Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will. He said God through Jesus will make you complete to do everything you need to know how to do. Every good work as opposed to dead works. He said working in you what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. He said God will make you complete. God will make you mature. God will make you successful. Don't try and make yourself successful. Don't try and make yourself, don't try and fix your own marriage. You can't. Don't try and fix your own family life. You can't. Don't try and fix anything. You're no good at it. You just simply can't do it. He said God will make you complete. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Second, remember I told you we have qualified. He said we're qualified. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Now let's find out how you get disqualified. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. So we're supposed to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. Let's figure out how to know if we're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are disqualified? What disqualifies you? Not knowing Jesus is inside of you. Because if you don't know he's in here, you will get disqualified. Not by God, but by yourself. You will disqualify yourself. He said, examine yourself every day and make sure you are aware Jesus is in here. Jesus, the, the, the Bible says he's made unto us wisdom. He's made unto us righteousness. He's made unto us healing. He's made unto us blessing. He's made unto us prosperity. Jesus is everything. He's all in all. A couple more verses. Philippians 1.3. We're going to do three chapters in a row in Philippians. Or Philippians 1.3. <clears throat> I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine making request for you with all joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing. That he who has begun a good work. Where? in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He said, he began the work in you, and he will finish the work in you. And all you got to do is acknowledge the good thing that's in you. When, don't say, I got an anger problem. Say, the Lord Jesus is delivering me from anger. The Lord Jesus doesn't have an anger problem. I was listening to Creflo Dollar yesterday, and he, or a couple days ago. He said something I never really heard. And I, it kind of amused me when I heard it. He said, I no longer try and believe stuff. He said, I started believing Jesus believes it. Think of, let's think about this for a minute. He said, sometimes I got some, a health issue and I'm having a hard time believing for it. He said, and then I realized, well, why am I trying to believe for it? I believe Jesus believes it. That's this message. I believe Jesus believes it. I believe Jesus believes I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I believe Jesus believes I'm by his stripes I were healed. I believe Jesus believes that he, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for me. I believe Jesus believes that that's what he's talking about here. When Creflo said that, I'm like, well, that's my sermon, but in a different way. I believe in the Lord Jesus who is in me. Jesus can accomplish the work. Jesus can set me free. Jesus can bring me to victory. Jesus can fix anything. You know, when I was a little kid, my, my dad, well, I wasn't real. I mean, when I was 11, 12 years old, my dad, Watson, in Germany, that man could fix anything. 
I could take anything to him. And Carolyn's dad was the same way. When Carolyn was a kid, her dad could fix anything. Well, that just seemed that way to a little child. Our Lord Jesus can indeed fix anything. He can raise the dead. Four days stinky in the tomb doesn't matter to him. Remember they ask of the prophet Ezekiel, can these dry bones in the desert live? I love Ezekiel's answer, you know. The Lord goes, yeah, they can. Just start saying, just start speaking, start acknowledging, acknowledging, acknowledging the good thing that is in you. He is in here. Greater is, I mean, this should be our verse all the time. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Greater is the Holy One inside of me. I have the victory. I am not working towards victory. I am fighting from victory. I walk in victory, and the only time that victory seems to get stolen from me is when I quit acknowledging who's in me. He said, be confident. Have confidence, not in you, but in he. He who? He, Jesus. He who has begun a good work in you. When did he begin the good work in you? On the day you got saved. It says, have confidence in Jesus. He can finish the job. He can get you where you need to be. Quit helping him. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need your assistance. Don't help him. Go to Philippians 2.13, next chapter. <clears throat> Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Now, I'm going to give you even more liberty. Who handles the will part of it? People go, well, I, don't, I don't want to do it. I don't have the willpower. I don't desire to do it. God will handle that too. It's perfectly okay to say, God, I don't want to, I don't want to be nice to my wife. I want, to be, I want to yell at her. I don't want to do this. And God will say, well, I'll work on your will then first, son. That's what you... The minute you tell him, Lord, you in me said, love my wife as Christ loved the church. You in me, you... Obviously, I can do it because you're in here. Now he'll work on your will. He'll work on your will and he'll work on your doing. You don't have to do it. He will work on your desire. He will make you willing to be willing. And he will make you or help make you do it, but give you the capacity to do it. Why? Because it gives him pleasure. It gives him pleasure. God doesn't get any pleasure when we fail. God doesn't get any pleasure when we're defeated. God doesn't, would you get a pleasure if your kid comes home and he got beat up? I shared this story before and I shouldn't share it again, but I'm going to. I remember one time we were at church, at our home church, House of Prayer, and, and Michael and Kyle, they were about six years old. Kyle's my, my brother's son, and, and he and Michael are almost the same age. And this big kid, maybe eight or nine, came and pushed Kyle, pushed him down. And I'm watching this at a little bit of a distance. And Michael, my son, jumps up, pops his kid in the chest, knocks him to the ground, and this kid kind of slinks away. And I'm going, yeah, yeah. I'm in church. I'm an alleged Christian. But I'm still going, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my boy. He took on it. A guy two, three years old and knocked his butt down, and the guy ran away. That's what God, do you, when, when David took on Goliath, what was David? He wasn't filled with God, but it's similar. He was acknowledging, I am a child of God. I am a child of the covenant. I'm going to take your head off. And I know God the Father is going, yeah, I like that kid. That is a boy after my own heart. Go get him, David. We'll get him. Go get him. That's what our father is after. He's going, you, you start acknowledging what's in here. You start acknowledging it. You start partnering with me, and you start recognizing everything you need is already in here. You don't have to go get it. You don't have to motivate God. You don't have to get him to come do anything. You don't have to talk God into it. Greater is he that's in you. He wants you to win. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to be delivered. And it's never too late. It is never too late. I was listening to the same Creflo Dollar messages. He's going, some of y'all are going, well, Pastor Dollar, I, you know, I messed up. I'm 65, 70 years old now. I missed, I, I missed my time. Quick Bible quiz question. How old was Moses when he started his ministry? 80. How old was Caleb when he started his ministry? Also 80. So unless you're 80, maybe if you're over 80, and nobody in this room is over 80, but we, we, we have these natural tendencies, and he's going, no, 
You know, God inside of you could add 50 years to your life if he wanted to. He could make you younger. I mean, think about Sarah. She got, I mean, this woman was 90 years old and got so hot looking that some king, heathen king, wanted her. And heathen king don't go by inner beauty. You know, the heathen king didn't say, well, she's all wrinkled and kind of ugly out on the outside, but she's got inner beauty. No. In fact, women, you should claim that because you are daughters of Sarah. Sarah's youth was renewed. That blessing of God, that life of God began to flow in her. We, we have infinite power available to us, and we live at this low, low level because we don't acknowledge it. Because we sound, we think we're sounding arrogant or prideful. No, you're arrogant and prideful when you say, I got this. You're humble when you say, he's got this. God in me, he's got it. One more verse, Philippians 4.13. Everybody knows this verse. Philippians 4.13, might even be on your refrigerator. After tonight, I want you to actually believe it. I can do all things through Christ who empowers me, who energizes me, who strengthens me. He said, I can do everything, not in my ability, but through Christ who is in me. The hope of glory, that mystery. He said that thing that the Old Testament saints wanted that I've got. The power of God living inside of me. He said, I can do all things. So now the bad part is, you're never allowed to ever, ever say again, I can't handle this. I can't do this. I can't take this anymore. You are saying this verse is not true. Acknowledge the good thing that is in you. Acknowledge what he said. I can do it. I can endure. I can overcome. I can win the victory. And I lied. I have one more verse. Luke 17, 20. Luke 17, 20. <clears throat> It wasn't really a lie. I wasn't trying to deceive you. Luke 17, 20. This is Jesus talking. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Keep going. Nor will they say, Here it is, see here or see there. Indeed, the kingdom of God is inside of you. It's within you. The Pharisees said, we want to see when God's kingdom shows up. And Jesus is like, you'll never see it, never see it. Because where is the kingdom of God right now, in this moment, on a Saturday night, November, or whatever it is, 11th, where is the kingdom of God? Right in here. And everything that's in the kingdom is in here. All the blessing, all the life, all the peace, all the joy, all the power, all the anointing, all the deliverance, all the victory, all the everything you need is in here. But we've got to go within so we quit going without. We have got to acknowledge the good things that are in us. So right now I'm giving my wife permission to correct me because I've had, I've had issues. I, I can be a negative Nelly sometimes. Not like I used to be. I mean, I was, when I was a young man, I was Eeyore. It'll never work. It'll be a disaster. It'll... I was genius. I used to be genius at pointing out what was wrong. If you ever read How to Win Friends and Influence People, he says any fool can point out what's wrong and most fools do. I was genius at pointing out what was wrong. I was genius at finding the problem and why it wouldn't work. For the last 30 some years, God has been taking me to a point where, no, all things are possible to him that believes. All things inside of you, the power of God is in here. So this week, my advice is begin to work on this attitude of, wait a minute, the greater one is in me. The Spirit of God is in me. Jesus of Nazareth is in me. The creator of the universe is in me. You don't need more power. you got all the power you need. It's all in here. You don't need more miracles. All the miracles are in here. You don't need more deliverance. It's all in here. You just got to start acknowledging it. And he said, when you acknowledge it, you energize and partner your faith with his. So, Father, we thank you. We do. Golly, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, thank you, thank you for the mystery of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that, that you live in us and, and that you never leave us or forsake us. Lord Jesus, thank you. And I ask you to help every single person in this room this week to be aware, to be aware of you inside of them, of you in their lives, of you operating in us, Lord. Help us to be aware of you and to quit being aware of all the circumstances around us because your name is higher than any name. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we acknowledge you as such that you live in us. We ask you to bless the food and the fellowship and everything else we do in Jesus' name.